Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Hello again. Welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, Nico Perino, and I'm here in our Philadelphia studios today with my colleague, Alex Mori. Alex, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So last time we had you on the show, we were looking at private internet censorship efforts here in the United States. We were looking at how companies like Facebook and Google were filtering what we can and can't see on their platforms. Right. With We were looking at human reviewers and bots and all these new emerging technologies and kind of taking a look at um, the scary stuff. The scary stuff. Well, we we left the reviewers and the bots at home for this podcast. Uh, at least the American ones. Yeah, at least the American ones. But yeah, we were talking about the potential problems that might arise from those reviewers and bots and speech codes that these private internet companies were instituting. You know, we were talking about how our internet is our new public square after all, and it's not at all clear what we should expect from it, especially when private actors, not the government, is controlling who can say what online. But what do we do when it is the government doing the censoring on the Internet and there's no First Amendment, for example, to place rules on it? And so as it turns out, unfortunately, we do not need to hop in a time machine to this future Orwellian universe that we're imagining for this edition of So to Speak. I talk to experts who say that this worst case scenario is happening right now and getting worse every day in China. So let me just tell you, Nico, one thing that I love so much about So To Speak is that we really do try to get out of the campus box, you know, our bread and butter of what we do, Fire's Wheelhouse, uh, and go wherever we want to, really. And today we're going all the way to the Great Firewall of China. The free speech principles that apply off campus can and often are applied in an on-campus context as well. So it's important that we study all sorts of censorship. But Alex, you mentioned the Great Firewall of China. Everyone knows the <laughs> the Great Wall of China, of course. But for people who don't know, what exactly is the Great Firewall of China? Okay, so it's a little bit complicated, but to break it down, it's basically a system of controls that the Chinese government uses to monitor take down and even manipulate content on its internet. So people in China have access to only a very limited amount of information when they log onto the internet. They're not really logging onto the internet as we know it. It's more of a intranet. Intranet. Yeah. So here in the United States, we're used to a relatively free and open internet. Now, there are certain platforms, as we discussed in our last podcast, uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, where they're, they're implementing speech code so that certain content is filtered out or depreciated. But what are they doing in China to limit what they can say and see? Well, so I think this now would be a good place to start in with my first source. You're about to hear from Charlie Smith. He is a censorship expert working in China. And so I asked him, for those of us who've never done it before, Charlie, what's it like to log on? There's nothing to describe, really. If you try to access Google or Facebook, you wait a little bit and then the request times out. No special alarms go off and nobody knocks on your door. So now, full disclosure here. I said that was Charlie Smith, but it's also technically not Charlie Smith because that's not his real name. That's not his real voice. Everything you've heard and are about to hear from Charlie was communicated over email using a pseudonym. Uh, And then at his request, we hired a voice actor to record The interview, um, he wouldn't even agree to sort of like voice modulation or anything like that. That is the level of secrecy that Charlie needs to use to protect his identity. So, Nico, you see what we're working with here. Um, It's... uh Difficult. Su- super spy stuff. Yeah, yes. but th- but this is the guy. That's right. I, he, there are several, um, I mean, China's got a billion people, so there are, um, I would say there's many people working on it, but Charlie Smith, I would argue, is the most prominent. Um, but he's still an anonymous source. With safety in mind, as top priority here, I did try to push him for any info I could get. Okay, Charlie, what can you tell me? 
I'm a co-founder of GreatFire.org along with Martin Johnson. I'm going to guess Martin Johnson is also a pseudonym. You're catching on quick here, Nico. We operate anonymously inside China. We started Great Fire in 2011 with a website that tests whether or not a certain site is blocked in China. Our goal then was to bring transparency to internet censorship in China. But as time passed, we realized we could also help Chinese gain access to censored material. And a lot of that material is entire websites. And they're the ones that you and I use most. When you think about websites you use most, what? Google, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Instagram. That's I an know. app, that's, but yeah. That's right. Yeah. So all of these are um, these kind of major- The fire.org. I wonder if that's- thefire.org, our website. It's actually not, inexplicably. Um, and if you want to find out what is censored, there's an app for that, or I guess a Charlie Smith created website for that. You can just go to greatfire.org slash analyzer. They've got this analyzer tool that you can use to put in any website and see if China has recently censored it. So Charlie's organization, Great Fire, um, whoever Charlie is and whoever his people are, um, they won Index on Censorship's 2016 prize for digital activism. That group gives out a variety of they prizes. Have a magazine, yeah. Exactly. Um, one of the more prominent groups looking into groups. censorship on an international scale. Exactly. Um, so they won that prize in 2016. And they now have, uh, from starting back in 2011, they now have a multi-pronged approach for trying to breach this great firewall. It's bringing forbidden information in a variety of ways to the Chinese people. For example... We operate two websites where we repost information that has been censored by the authorities. So those two websites, Free Weibo and Free WeChat, Weibo is basically the Chinese version of Twitter. And on this site that Charlie and his crew run, they repost everything that was censored on Weibo. So through some technological means, they are able to figure out what it is that the government is trying to block before it ever goes up or what they take down, and then they put it up. When I looked recently, you know, talking about what are the kinds of things that are being censored, it was people talking about, for example how interesting or potentially beneficial it might be to have a government that uses checks and balances. No. <laughs> so <laughs> there were also a lot of random things like people trying to sell shoes like in a spammy way or something like posting this shoe ad a million times. So apparently the Chinese Well, there are, like I, if I understand uh, the culture that's arisen in China correctly, they sometimes use code words or code phrases to talk about these issues that the Chinese government forbids talking about on the internet and that we as Westerners won't know about because, well, we're Westerners and we don't need to get around this internet blockade. Uh, I was looking online recently and some of the code words or phrases that we do know, for example, the Chinese use to get around this internet blockade include phrases like scale the wall or surround and watch. Surround and watch means public scrutiny. Scale the wall means getting around China's firewall. Uh, there's also the phrase take a walk, which means public protest or marches. And there's the phrase sensitive porcelain, which means, you know, these are words that are censored. So you know what I mean? Um, and the Chinese government, of course, can and, and does catch on to these code words, so they're always changing. But we, we as Westerners might not know, for example, what a shoe ad actually means. It could just be a shoe ad or it could also be something a little bit more significant. Maybe I'm just out of the loop, um, and that's probably how they want me. The Chinese government is doing everything that they can to figure out those codes and uh, take it down. So, that, I mean, that's just one example. But in terms of what uh, Charlie Smith here is up against, one of the taglines on the free Weibo site, if you go there and there's a, you can translate it into English, it looks like it's in Chinese um, because it is at first, but you can translate it into English. Um, it says, we ignore relevant laws and policies. Censorship and legis- laws. Yeah, right yeah, on the page. So, hence the the need to be so super secret. So uh, Great Fire is our fire uh, pen pal over in China. They are our firewall fighter. Our fire fighter, firewall fighters over in China are sort of very flagrantly saying we are going to do this no matter what you say, Chinese government. So bottom line is this is very serious, treacherous work. Westerners uh, found to have gone against the Chinese and and tried to counteract these censorship efforts would most likely, according to my sources, face uh, probably deportation or even jail time. (laughs) 
So the the People's Republic of China, the PRC, um, has as their ruling party in the country the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. So we've got the CCP and the PRC. Yeah, alphabet soup. That's right. And Xi Jinping is the leader of both the Communist Party as well as China's president, correct? Yeah, so he has a stronghold um, in all important places. One of the hallmarks of his rule has been this hyper focus that he has on getting China to become a world superpower. Um, There are a lot of ways that he's working on this, but one of the ways that has actually been effective so far, given that the Great Firewall still stands, is this very systematic censorship effort in the name of maintaining order and control through things like the Great Firewall. So how does the Great Firewall work? What is someone like Charlie Smith up against? So to answer that question, I turn to a couple more experts in this field. These are folks who have both lived in China for a long time, but who can talk to us now because they're safely here in the States. My name is Jeremy Goldcorn. Um, I lived in China from 1995 to uh, till 2015 for 20 years, mostly in Beijing, uh, mostly working in the media and internet industries. So Jeremy Goldcorn works for a company called SubChina that reports on media issues Sup. in China. SubChina. <laughs> so he is right in the thick of all this stuff. Um, and when he lived in China, um, he was even more in the thick of it because he had several websites, media startups that were often shut down by the government. So he knows firsthand what it's like, even though apparently he says he had it a little bit easy. Well, you know, as a foreigner, you you know, you get a lot more leeway. If you got into serious sort of political trouble, you would more likely just be deported than locked up for a long period of time. Uh, I was never doing anything that was explicitly political. Uh, But because of the kind of strict system of media controls, I kept on getting into trouble with one or other of the authorities or in the various things that I did. So like with Charlie, I asked, what's it like over there? Because, you know, he tells us, I don't know about Charlie, but he is definitely a Westerner, um, someone who's not a uh, Chinese national. Who has experience with a free Internet. That's right. Or mostly free Internet. Help us, we who have never logged on to this, you know, intranet type situation, what would it be like if we were to... To log online over there? Well, um, I think for Americans who've never been in an environment with a sense of the internet, perhaps the closest uh, experience may have been using, a, say, a high school library uh, internet where there's a kind of net nanny software and you just can't get to certain websites. So at its simplest, Jeremy says, the Great Firewall is just a set of uh, filters that block Uh, various websites. But it's far from simple, this set of filters. Uh, These filters are, in a word, comprehensive. Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, they include most major uh, international news websites such as the New York Times and the BBC. They include uh, any website belonging to organizations that the Chinese government doesn't like, such as Tibetan independence activist organizations uh, or uh, banned religious movements like Falun Gong. So these uh, websites you simply can't get to unless you know how to use a virtual private network or some other kind of uh, software that can hop over the firewall. Hop over or tunnel under. With one of these virtual private networks or VPNs. Yes. So the number one tool that people are using, at least until recently, were these virtual private networks or VPNs, as you said. So it's software that you download that acts like a private data tunnel that basically hides your identity and location from someone who would want to find you out, for example, the Chinese government. So Jeremy said it used to be a tool for a more sophisticated class of Chinese people mm-hmm. that were really into these, you know, internet issues, but that's no longer the case. Uh, in recent years, uh, as the censorship of outside internet has grown bigger and Chinese people are traveling more and have a bigger appetite for uh, foreign websites sites, the demand for VPNs has gone up. So if you're wondering how exactly these VPNs work, I won't bore everyone with how the internet works, but basically when 
you go to a website, um, your computer has um, what's called an IP address. And uh, your when you try to navigate, you know, you type in Google.com, that IP address gets to your internet service provider. So they know that you were trying to get to Google. In China, that would be really bad because the government can just ask those internet service providers what websites you tried to get to. And there's no laws that would allow uh, companies to fight such a request like here. Yeah, in the and speaking of laws, they can punish pretty much anything. Right. It, pretty much anything. Yeah. So Human Rights Watch, for example, takes issue with a lot of the laws in China right now that govern what people can say. Uh, for example, China has laws against humiliating innocent people um, or inciting division of the country, harming national unification, spreading rumors. So <laughs> who knows Who knows what any of that means? Yeah, it's but, pretty broad. It can go after anything. That's right. The answer is no one knows exactly what that means. And that's exactly the way the Chinese government wants it. So that really any kind of dissenting behavior can legally get you into trouble over there. And, and these VPNs could hide that sort of behavior. Though. Yes. So again, they act like this kind of tunnel that it would insulate you. Um, Charlie's site, Great Fire, again, I told you he's doing kind of a multi-pronged approach. He's publishing stuff that's taken down online. He's um, creating, you know, testing VPNs, uh, telling people which VPNs to use. He'll test the speed of them and list the most popular ones. The most popular one right now is called Hide My Ass. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> hide My Ass from the Chinese government, all the way down to like Tor, which is a um, one of these kind of VPN softwares. I wonder that if is, they have laws against you know, profanity. The, they probably do, but I guess if you're creating these things, you just don't care. Um, but true to form, the Chinese government, because this has recently become much more popular with the average Joe, the VPNs. these VPNs, they have now clamped down. And they recently passed a law saying that it's basically almost totally illegal to download these VPNs. What they want people to do is um, use a state-sponsored VPN. Oh, of course. Which, of course. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that. Uh, who would even do that? Because, I mean, that's basically... Yeah, I mean, you do the math here. Um, so how safe can that be, right? Um so now, if you want to access this content that was already illegal, if you want to get to the BBC or you want to talk with get somebody on York Facebook, Times, yeah. look at the New York Times, figure out for yourself what is true and not in the world, um, you'd have to get one of these VPNs. And so now you're probably committing at least two major crimes by having the VPN and then using it. Uh, one of the really interesting twists that I wanted to tell you about is that um, the people that I talked to have said that this censorship culture has led to um, some benefits. There's a great culture of innovation in China right now. You know, they say, what is it like? necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. So because they can't get to a lot of these websites, uh, these really smart Chinese engineers have put together these great websites that I guess you would say kind of take the edge off, I guess. Um, so for example, I asked Jeremy about one of the most popular apps in China right now called WeChat. Uh, that's one of the legal ones. You can have WeChat in China. And you can basically do every single thing you want to do in this app. So um, this is an app that was um, launched by one of China's biggest internet companies called Tencent. Uh, and it, you know, people used to say it's something like WhatsApp. But if you combine WhatsApp and Facebook and Venmo and PayPal and Expedia or travel booking sites and uh, Uber and Lyft and pretty much any on-demand service you want, uh, and Instagram, you know, and Tumblr, and you stick it all in one app, this is what you get. Yeah, and you can pay for stuff too. You can basically do everything you need to do and never leave the app. And it's an incredibly well-designed app that, you know, you need to use if you want to get by in urban China now. You know, people use the app much more than text messages. It, it was perhaps the first and most prominent example of showing how, despite censorship, Chinese engineers are, are able to innovate and, you know, create technically excellent products. Um, but, yeah, it's also a part of the surveillance apparatus. Yeah, can you imagine all the data that's being collected? I mean, every account you have, on, it's on your phone, so it's GPS enabled. Um, so certainly China's got a real panopticon, you know, surveillance machine as disciplinary machine, and it's very scary. So it's not just the censorship threat coming from the Chinese government and the Great Firewall, but there's also this implication in the broader culture. 
Right. So everyone I talked to was very careful to warn me. It's not just the Great Firewall. There's also, there's basically two tracks of censorship in China. There's the Great Firewall, and then there are many of these other sort of the censorship culture put in place by the Chinese government that filters down to the Chinese people and causes self-censorship on the part of companies and people themselves. Some of whom are doing so... Uh, you know, these private companies doing so at the behest of the government. Very much so. Uh, And they probably wouldn't be doing it if the government didn't ask them to. But China is a major market, the market. They want to do business in China, so they do what the government says. Kind of a funny aside was that, um, like, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, Facebook has been trying to break, Facebook has been trying to do everything within their power to break into this market because it's, I think he he said, how can we run a platform, this is paraphrasing now, how can we run a platform that uh, connects the world when we're missing the largest country? Yeah. So um, there was a funny picture of, well, <laughs> he probably doesn't think it's so funny now, but there was a picture of him like jogging with some leaders in Tiananmen Square and everyone was <laughs> making fun of him for like not wearing a mask or whatever. But he's like tri- he's like pandering to the Chinese people. This is one of it. That's why he learned Mandarin. I think it was a couple yeah, years ago. Yeah, I saw, I saw the clips of him speaking Mandarin. Yep, as one of his, every year he makes that resolution. And so he was like, please China, let Facebook be. Um, and it, it worked for a little while but then they shut it back down. Yeah. Um, so I also talked to, um, you know, speaking of people who are in the know on this stuff, I also talked to Bill Bishop, who runs uh, the a very highly regarded newsletter on China called Cynicism. Um, that's spelled with an S, but, you know, it sounds like uh, cynicism. Well, it's also spelled with a C. I'm looking at it here. It's S-I-N-O-C-I-S-M. That's, that's right. Um, and so, it's a newsletter. Yes, it's a newsletter on China. You might know his name because he was one of the co-founders of CBS's Market Watch. Oh, right. Back in the yeah. 90s, yeah. So he's written um, a lot on China, you know, for the New York Times, all these publications. He lived in Beijing for over a decade. Um, he's in the States now. But basically, if you're a China policy wonk, like people in the government, they're reading Bill Bishop's newsletter on China every morning. They've got it in their hands. So he and Jeremy um, both really uh, stressed how important it is to look at these two tracks of censorship. As you uh pointed out, Nico, more than ever before, uh, both companies and people are self-censoring because of it. Here's Bill Bishop. Then you have a whole system the government has set up to uh, where they basically push the, push the main tasks onto private companies who have to filter for um, an ever-growing and changing list of keywords and topics. And again, those the filters that they're doing, that the Chinese government is doing, it's not just algorithms. It's not just bots. The big companies have hundreds of thousands of employees whose job is to actually filter content. Their job is censorship. It sort of reminds me of Winston Smith, the main character in George Orwell's 1984. And he worked in the Ministry of Truth, where it was his job to sort of filter history or rewrite it according to the party's needs. So in China, there is a there is a literal, I, I hate to say literal, but there is a ministry of truth. In China right now, there is a ministry of truth. <laughs> there, um, They have a different name. So those, and these companies are in contact, I'm assuming, with, the, with that ministry. The ministry of truth is reaching out to these companies on a regular basis. Here's Bill. You know, the Chinese government and the Communist Party, uh, soon after Xi Jinping took power, uh, set up this... Um, what's called the, the, the leading group for cyber affairs. And under that, they set up the Cyberspace Administration of China, which is the overarching regulator for Internet stuff. So Cyberspace Administration of China, uh, a.k.a. the Ministry of Truth, and their job is to tell these people what is OK and not these OK companies, yeah. when it comes to truth. Yes, exactly. So like Jeremy was saying, when he was in China trying to set up these new companies, reporting on things on media issues from inside China, he was on the phone frequently with regulators who had just you know, shut down his site. He was trying to smooth talk him into putting yeah. it back up. Um, perhaps, though, what struck me as maybe the most crucial crucial part of the self-censorship apparatus here is that the Chinese have, for the most part, you know, over a billion people, they have signed on. They have allowed this to happen. Why? Why? Well, one of the issues, one of the main issues is civics education or lack of it, what we Americans would consider civics education, this kind of diet of 
freedom and liberty and things that are important in China. It's the more, values that we as Americans exactly hold dear in China are different in China. In a word, they don't value it as much. Here's Jeremy Goldcorn. Of course, the education system and the media are, are highly censored, um, and for most people, you know, that's what they're used to, um, and they don't necessarily see the upside of pushing the limits of free expression. It does happen sometimes in certain situations. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the average Chinese person is not sitting there thinking, you know, fretting about censorship. Um, they're sitting there, you know, ordering a, you know, uh, a new style Shanghai cheese tea, you know, delivered in, you know, 30 minutes um, after you order it uh, by a guy on an electric bicycle. <laughs> so so um, whatever this cheese tea is, I kind of want to try it. Yeah, if only we had WeChat right <laughs> That's now. That's right. We could order the cheese tea. We could pay for it. We could review it. And then the Chinese government could know that we're super into cheese tea. You know, things like WeChat, cheese tea, whatever, it's kind of taking the edge off of life in this ultra censored state that China's in right now. But I asked, to what effect? And here we get to, I felt like it was a bit of cultural relativism. But, uh, Jeremy again. You know, one thing to remember about uh, the way the authoritarian system works in China. I mean, first of all, I think, you know, a lot of Americans think it's communist. It's, they think of, um, you know, 1984. That's the classic sort of totalitarian. Sort of like I did. Yes, exactly. But China is not a totalitarian state. And a much better comparison is the novel Brave New World, you know, where people are basically seduced by pleasure so that they don't worry too much about what the, the powers that be are doing. And Jeremy also mentioned that things we all kind of know, you kind of adapt to the culture that you're raised in. People in China are troubled by it, but less than Americans would be. But on the other hand, I mean, people in China and most of the rest of the world are extremely troubled by the idea of being able to go into a Walmart and buy a, a powerful gun, you know, whereas Americans are completely used to the idea that you might go to school and some kid with an automatic machine gun will, you know, blow your head off. That's normal here. You know, we, we accept that risk to live here. And in China, you accept, uh, you know, a state that uh, thinks it has a right to snoop into your, you know, email. <laughs> that's kind of part of the bargain. Uh, look, so, well, definitely fair point to Jeremy on the gun thing. Uh, this interview was, with him was done before the latest mass school shooting in Parkland, Florida, that has been making headlines. Um, so perhaps his point about that is even more notable now. But Charlie Smith, our super undercover censorship fighter, uh, he said Jeremy's analogy, this cultural relativism sort of thing, might not be quite right. Here's Charlie to explain more. Some Chinese, not all, are smack dab in the middle of being part of a growing consumer class in China. But money can't buy everything. Yeah, so they, he says, you know, they might suddenly be able to afford the newest iPhone, but they're also getting wise to the fact that Apple, maker of the iPhone, is working hand-in-hand -hand with the Chinese government to make their favorite VPN app that would make that iPhone useful to them. Um, At least useful for accessing the whole of the Internet. That's right. They're working with the Chinese government to make um, that access illegal. Basically, there's growing unrest amongst the Chinese people. They increasingly don't understand why they're being treated as second-class information citizens. And I don't think it's about wanting democracy. It's about enjoying certain rights and freedoms. And it's about defining legal gray areas and eliminating the ability for authorities to label you as a troublemaker for the slightest transgression. Okay, I want to pivot ever so slightly to talk about this one study that piqued my interest in what's happening in China initially. The study's called How Censorship in China Allows Government Criticism but Silences Collective Expression. It was written in 2013 by Gary King, Jennifer Pan, and Margaret Roberts. They figured out what the government is really looking for when it censors stuff. Yeah, uh, and, know, and... Go ahead. <laughs> well, and what was really interesting is they sort of stumbled... You're chomping at the bit. To Sorry, <laughs> I'm so it. excited about this um, this study because it was one of those like happy accidents in science, social science, I guess, um, where they really stumbled on this data set that all of a sudden they were like, whoa, we can get access to all the stuff that the Chinese government is censoring. And how so, they're doing it. And how they're doing it. And here's what Professor Gary King over at Harvard um, told Harvard's Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, their podcast, on the truly shocking result that he came up with two graduate students in his lab. We thought the uh, censors would take something down from the web 
if you criticize the leaders, their policies, or the state. It turns out to be completely and utterly wrong. They don't censor criticism. In fact, you can say the leaders of this town are all stealing money. Here's how much. These are the bank accounts that they have them uh, stored in. And by the way, they all have mistresses and here are their names and that won't be censored. But if you say, and let's go protest, and the protest is related to something that's happening on the ground, then that will be censored. In fact, if you say the leaders of this other town are doing such a great job, let's have a rally in their favor, that will also be censored. They don't care what you think of them, and they only care what you can do. The Chinese people, I mean, the over a 1 billion Chinese people, they have so much power in China and the government knows it, and that's what scares them. They're not afraid of calling them names, but sticks and stones, uh, the, or the, in particular, the ability to move people. That's the thing that threatens the regime. Not the U.S., not Western powers, not military from other countries, but their own people. And if their own people are an alternative source of power, then they'll stop them. That's the issue. Seeing these censored posts at scale and figuring out these rules, they were able to test that hypothesis. And it turns out they were right. When we would monitor a dissident who has shown the ability to uh, create collective action on the ground in the past, uh, something would go viral about that dissident. According to the rules that we inferred from our early analyses, we would predict that all of those would be censored. And, and of course, it would be. And, and we would found it would be censored. And they can even, uh, Gary and his team, they can even take it one very important step further. Then we can invert it and we can say, when there's censorship, we know that there's something on the ground happening. And we can predict and have predicted when three or four days ahead of time, before they pick up a dissident, before they sign a peace treaty, before a scandal breaks, we can actually see signals of it ahead of time. One of the really interesting things about the way that they sort of divert people's attention is that they're not, um, Gary King and his team figured out, is that they're not just taking things down. They're also putting things up. A lot of this innocuous drivel. Um, it's like the cat videos on Facebook that give you a quick dopamine hit and you can't you can't look away. Yeah, people just talking about nonsense and it's distracting people on days when they think these uh, calls for collective action might come out. They want to fill that space with the distracting stuff. Um, so really uh, fascinating, fascinating study on uh I don't know, on how on how this censorship, this most extensive effort to selectively censor human expression ever um, is working. And, it, it, you know, in some ways it does seem to be. Working. And so this data set that um, the that the Harvard professor found is sort of explaining to us what the Chinese government is doing when it censors sites like Charlie's. Exactly. Well, or, or how they settle on censoring those sites. Yeah. Or well, it's not necessarily Charlie sites, but the sites that Charlie he monitors. What the sites that he monitors. Anything that even seems remotely threatening is going down or taken down before it ever goes up. Getting back to Charlie a bit because he's such an interesting character, man. Um, I asked him a little bit about. What are the consequences? Obviously, he is sort of an extreme example where it's like if they get a hold of him and figure out who he is, he's done for. Um, hang in there, Charlie. But what if you're an average Joe? What are the consequences for you talking about something the Chinese government doesn't want you to talk about, which is, you know, a <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you don't even really know what that is. What are the consequences? Rumors. Just even displeasure with how things are going. Here's Charlie. If you choose to voice these sentiments on your social media in China, they will quickly be erased. Depending on the severity of your statements, you may get invited for tea, which uh, is a euphemism for being interrogated by the authorities. And I bet it's not even the cool cheese tea or anything. Um, no, it's probably not, not even tea at all. There's pro there would be a very disappointing uh, invitation for tea. So Charlie says the government is uh, instead serving uh, fear and frustration. That's what he called it. Um, and it's not just Charlie who's saying this. Everyone I talked to said displeasure is growing along with increasingly strict controls. But it is definitely true that a growing subset of people are getting tired Benefits of innovation be damned. A uh, guy on a motorbike delivering whatever you want be damned. WeChat. They're, uh, WeChat. They're getting tired of the status quo. And here's Bill Bishop. There was a lot of anger that um, they were treated like children. And they, there's a lot of actual um, embarrassment that basically the only countries that, that really don't have any access to Facebook or, say, North Korea and China 
And that raises, as Bill puts it, um, sort of the key question in all of this. Um, and so if China really truly has aspirations to be a great power, what are they afraid of? The answer is basically, as we kind of talked about, a lot, anything and everything. I mean, what it comes down to basically is the Communist Party is not confident enough that it can maintain control of the country if people have access to free, free access to information. Yeah, and that's exceptionally powerful when they when they do have access to that information. And it makes sense then why studies like the Harvard one that you mentioned uh, would focus so much on collective action. We think back to the Arab Spring, of course, and the and the movements in the squares to and and even in Iran, they were they're afraid of people recently. Um, they're worried about um, you know people getting together. They want to silence it. They don't want people speaking up to power. Yeah, I mean, if you think about every major revolution. <laughs> In the history of the world, it's always been people getting together. That's just how these things. Yeah, has um, ever, I wonder work. if there's ever been a a revolution in which people have not organized in physical space. I, gosh, you'd be hard pressed to find one. I would think. Yeah, there might be one out there. Write us if you know of one. But yes, yeah, we see this on campuses too. You know, once students speak their minds, or once we at fire get word out about some type of civil liberties violation, people start to get angry and um, not always mobilizing in in physical space, but sometimes they are, and that's really when we start to see see changes you know um you know often these institutions can't defend in public what they do in do in private sunlight's the best disinfectant as louis brandeis said yeah and here in the states you know we we take it for granted i uh i asked charlie actually about uh you know what he might say to a student here in the states who maybe is nervous about speaking up or something um because there are plenty of students that we work with on a regular basis who are nervous about speaking up worried about the consequences i was like you know good reason would you have cases, yeah. i was like i bet you charlie have no sympathy for these people because it's not like they're gonna get their heads chopped off or something mm, to um what he said was that college campuses are a hugely powerful place for this kind of activism. Closer to home every day, I'm inspired by Joshua Wong and the student movement in Hong Kong and believe the world would be much better if we had more people like him challenging accepted norms. And so then when I was really thinking about this, you know, could this kind of censorship happen here? I was talking to Bill Bishop. Um, I asked, could this happen here? And he says, Oh, I think if the Constitution is, is destroyed, it could. I, I don't think a lot that, you know, we have the First Amendment. And so I think that that is unlikely we'll get to that. So that, you know, if you think back to the work that Charlie's doing, that's really the fundamental reason why he does a lot of the work that he does. It's not just about getting people access to these websites today or, you know, getting Facebook in China. It's about people caring enough to establish their rights, that they have the right to freedom of information, freedom of expression, and that that is a benefit for them, getting people to recognize that that is good for their society. Yeah, and that's what I was, uh, when I mentioned Leo Xiaobo, who won the Nobel Peace Prize and then was subsequently imprisoned by the Communist Party for signing on to a petition. That's what the petition was calling for. It was coming, calling for, you know, freedom of speech, open access to information, some of these like core components of we could, what we consider a democratic society. And even though there are, you know, as the folks I talked to said, there are some benefits to what China is trying to do right now in becoming a superpower in, you know, increasing prosperity, things like that, someone like Charlie thinks that in the long run, the Chinese will suffer. Much more than wealth, not just material wealth, would be created for everybody if there was a free and open internet. A censored internet negatively affects many areas where access to information is essential for progress. Education, research, science, health, the environment. These are all traditionally areas where Chinese have excelled, but long term, China will fall behind. China has given so much to the world and Chinese have so much more to give if only the ruling party would let them. And so I asked if he's still hopeful. I asked, you know, what excites him? If anything, what excites him right now about the work that he's doing? Uh, I think what's most exciting for us now is what the future holds. More and more organizations understand what we do and either want to support our work or make their own investments into anti-censorship efforts. We've been able to show that it is possible to beat the censors. Hopefully this emboldens others to join the fight. If you want to learn more about the work Great Fire is doing to bring information to the people of China, or to donate to this really cool cause. After you donate to our fire, of Yes, course. <laughs> of course. Just, just go to greatfire.org. 
This podcast is hosted by me, Nico Perino, and produced by my colleague here, Alex Mori. It's also edited and recorded by my colleague, Aaron Reese. To learn more about, so to speak, the Free Speech Podcast, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also call in questions for a future show at 215-315-0100, or you can write us an email at so to speak at the fire.org. If you liked this show, if you liked what Alex discovered, please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. As I mentioned, every single week, reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. Now, until next time, I thank you all for listening. Mm-hmm.